Hi, guys. Welcome to a special episode of People Every Day. I'm your host, Janine Rubenstein, and I have a question. Can we talk for a minute? (laughs) We are about to do just that with the musician who, thanks to one of his most beloved songs, made that very question famous. I grew up listening to 90s R&B phenom Tevin Campbell singing along to his hits, Can We Talk? And tell me what you want me to do. I swooned like everyone else when he'd pop up for a cameo on The Fresh Prince or Moesha. And then, and this proves I'm a millennial, when he lent his one-of-a-kind voice to the soundtrack of a goofy movie in 1995, belting out the hits Stand Out and Eye to Eye as frontman of the all-time best animated rock group, Powerline. <laughs> That was it for me. I became a lifelong fan. A lot has happened since then for the star whose career began when he was just 12 years old. You guys, there's been trials and triumphs and a deeply personal journey most people don't know about. But he's here with me now to bear it all. So if I may steal another hit song title of his, I'm ready. Tevin, (laughs) welcome to the show. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you for having me, Shanine. Oh, it is such a pleasure it's and a pleasure an honor. To be here. Thank you. Look, it has been a, a while since most fans have gotten to see you in action, but recently you performed at the African American Museum of Music in Nashville. And this is a museum where you are featured and your amazing work is featured. So, what was that like? Take me into that moment. It was great. It was great. I, uh, I always get nervous before events like that, but it's great to be honored in that in that way. And uh, I'm in a point in my life now where I'm actually able to appreciate the things that I did back then. So that was one of those moments. What'd you perform for those who didn't get to see it? Oh, you know, the ones in. Everybody loves, can we talk? I'm ready. Break it down. We'll shh, break it down. Always in my heart. Goodbye from the first album, uh, you know. There was never any doubt that you would have a very storied career. I think it was Quincy Jones who said, you know, around when you were discovered at 12 that he likened you to Aretha Franklin and Stevie Wonder. And then you had round and round hit, hit song with Prince. So what was that like? If you can go back and think, like to be put on a pedestal like that at such a young age, like not even a teen. There was a lot of pressure. Uh you know, the next Michael Jackson. It wasn't so much a pressure meeting those people and working with those people because I was a kid. But the pressure was saying, hearing things like the next Stevie Wonder, the next Michael Jackson. He sounds like Michael Jackson. That's a lot of pressure because I just kind of wanted to just be me, you know. But also it's a big compliment to be compared to people like that. There's not a lot of people that get compared to Michael Jackson or Stevie Wonder, you know. Um So that's pretty cool, too. Well, everyone was dying to work with you. That is for sure. And I hear that there is an interesting, funny, behind-the-scenes story to the song Can We Talk, one of your biggest hits. (laughs) So what happened? How did that song come to be? And how did it almost come to be in a completely different way? Okay, Can We Talk, and unbeknownst to me when I was recording, when I was a kid, I had no idea that this was the story behind Can We Talk. But apparently, L.A. Reid wanted to wanted Usher to have Can We Talk, and Babyface wanted me to have Can We Talk, and it was a huge, huge fight because at the time, Usher was signed to L.A. Face Records, I think. Mm-hmm. And me and Usher <laughs> actually talk about we talked about this last week, but I won't get into that conversation. <laughs> We're both over it. He's over it. I'm over it. But I've been talking a lot about it. In a lot of the interviews that I've been doing lately, but he's the one that brought it up like uh, six months later. He was like, well, Can We Talk was supposed to be mine. And so that's how it all started. I told him, I was like, you the one that brought it up. How big was this fight behind the scenes? I have no idea. I think they sort of like split up over, that was one of the many fights that they were, one of the many disagreements that they were having at that time that they were working with me because they they were not on the uh, third album. Notice, you know, LA fake, they had already split up by then. Like I said, while it was happening, I had no idea. I don't want people to know. Like, I read about this from, so this is like secondhand knowledge. But yeah, that's that's the story. Wow. Well, it, it landed exactly where it was supposed to. And it has even had a resurgence on social media, has it not? The Can We Talk Challenge. I think Tank started it. Can we? Tank started started the whole trend, and it went on for like months. Yes, you know, and it was amazing. It was amazing, and I don't say this is because 
uh, it's my song and mm -hmm. I sang the song. But Can We Talk is actually just an incredible song. I had no idea at the time, like when I was 15 or 16 recording the song, that it would have that impact. I was just a kid singing in the studio. You know, I listened to the songs. If I liked it, I sing it. But I didn't think about the future. But oh my God, that song is really, really powerful. And all the new generations are learning it because their parents listen to it. Yeah. What I loved about the challenge was that all the, the talent that I got to see on TikTok, yeah. like the young talent, it was amazing. Yeah. Like, why aren't these kids being signed? You know? Mm -hmm. Where are these kids? Like, they were saying, can't slaying, can we talk? We have the original right here. I'm just saying, like, what is this? I, I, can you tell me exactly how, like, take the up? Oh, no, I'm not going to sing it now. Don't even, don't, you know, I got to okay. warm up. Okay, okay. You got to realize I, I was 16 when I recorded that song. I'm 45 now, so I got to do a whole warm-up session. No, but I can still sing it, thank God, that I'm blessed yeah. to be able to still sing my most popular song mm -hmm. in the same key. You know, I do it live. I can still hit the notes. So that's a blessing. And I'm very, very blessed to be able to do that because not every singer can say that they can do that. We know that for sure. You know. Thanks to Versus. <laughs> but <laughs> Ooh, we're not going to get into that. Versus. All right. <laughs> oh, my God. That was horrible. Woo. But yeah, that's all I'm all saying. Right. Yeah. How did you see yourself back then? And how would you say, because it's all perception, how did you, would you say the world saw you? And was there a disconnect? at all did those two different perceptions identities not line up and if so when did you when did you realize that first of all i didn't think about any of that when i was a kid i was just yeah. it was work 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 if yeah. i wasn't in the studio i was doing videos if not that i was doing press tours if not press tours i was doing photo sessions i'm a country boy from a very small town in texas walks i have to texas and I started this when I was 12 years old so i had really didn't have time to sort of process all of that i enjoyed singing I enjoyed that. I enjoyed listening to songs and going into the studio and slaying them. Mm -hmm. They used to call me One Take Tevin, and I love that nickname. I don't know how the world perceived me. I think when you are introduced to the world as a kid, then that's how they always are going to see you. And I was introduced to the world in a big way. Quincy Jones, back on the block, with a song, a beautiful song, Tomorrow Better You Better Me, which I'm so proud that that was my first song. You know, That's, I think, how most of my fans, like my real, like older fans who mm -hmm. were, see me as a kid, this kid, I swear to God, I mean, I hear it all the time. You know, oh, you grew up, oh my God, how did you go? <laughs> but you look good, though, you look good, but you got gray hair. They still see me as a child star. So that's one of the cons of being a child star. Yeah. But in a way it's a pro because they, they love you like that. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I feel that yeah. it's not the same as not, that's coming out when you're 21 or 22. When you come out when you're 12, it's like, oh, he's, they always look at you as their baby. I think Warner Brothers sort of try to market me as a sex symbol, which was not a good idea yeah. in my opinion. I think that they had, they knew that they had a kid who had the mature voice who could sing these love songs. I think that most producers that I work with use me as a muse because they were going through all their relationships and you got this kid who can sing these songs and you, you know, so yeah. why not? I didn't know anything about it. Tell me what you want me to do, and always in my heart. I didn't know about this. I was yeah. just singing because I could pretend like I could feel, I could sing a song like that. Yeah. Anyway, they knew that they had this kid who could sing. And I think that people thought of me as this young kid who had this incredible voice. I don't think that, uh, I don't think the sex symbol thing worked. Well, it was a very different time back then than we're in now. And I mean, the R&B industry was so different. And I mean, it's still a very heteronormative space. So how did that affect you? I know you were so young then, but as you got older in the industry, when you entered your teens, entered your 20s, how was that space for you? And, and when you were trying to just understand yourself, understand your own life, your loves, your sexuality, all of that? Well, I didn't start understanding those things until I got away from the business until I left the business. Like I said, it was work. I didn't have time to process any of that. Yeah, uh, yeah I knew my sexuality, uh, I, but I didn't think of the representation that I didn't see in the business. I didn't think about those things. Yeah. When I came out to my family and my friends when I was about 19 or 20, that was it for me. And then I went on this road of discovering myself. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know how to do anything but go to the studio and sing. Like, yeah. who is this guy? Who are you? Well, you had Tevin. In 1991, T.E.V.I.E.V.I.E.V.I.E.V.I.E.V.I.E.V.I.E.V.I.E.V.I.E.V.I.E.V.I.E.V.I.E.V.I.E.V.I.E.V.I.E.V.I.E.V.I.E.
was going on at that period? This is like around 1996. And, and how did that sit with you? It was a hard time for me because I didn't, I didn't know what was going on, but there were a lot of politics that was going on at Warner Brothers. So I'll never forget showing up at the photo session for that album. And I had the twist. And they literally lost their minds. It's like, what are you doing? What are, why are you doing the twist? And then right after the I'm Ready, it was a huge fight with Prince and Warner Brothers. And those songs that he produced, they couldn't do anything with those songs because he didn't allow it. So it was a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes wow. with me and Warner Brothers yeah. that I didn't realize as a kid. Back to the World was a big, a big surprise for me. I didn't understand why I wasn't selling. Uh, I didn't understand why Warner Brothers wasn't concentrating on me as an artist. Yeah. Uh, but I know now. Ma Austin was there. Ray Harris, Hank Spann, all those people left. Those were all the people that made Tevin Campbell who he was, and they were black people. They started concentrating on the pop artists and the and the pop music. And there was a lot of changes going on with with R and B music at the time. Yeah. I also think it has a lot to do with just the child star syndrome. They didn't know what to do with me. You know, it's a business. So when did you decide to just take a step back for yourself? And, and was that a conscious decision? Like, I'm done, I'm out. I wasn't interested in doing any more albums. I was very, very pleased to be away from uh, Warner Brothers, to be away from just a whole world of it. I don't think I realized it until it happened. I did some very sporadic recording in between 2000 and 2004 with a lot of different producers, but nothing stuck. I wasn't, my heart wasn't in it. But then I got this call in 2004 to come and audition for a Broadway part on, in Hairspray. <laughs> I got to move to New York. I got to live on my own. And yeah. I had to sign in 30 minutes before showtime and I had to dress myself and I was working with a group of people, which was something that was totally new to me. Yeah. That was a great time in my life. I grew up a lot in those years, being around people that were like me, mm -hmm. LGBTQ plus people that were like living normal lives and had partners and I had never seen that. Yeah. That was pleasing to me, yeah. you know, and they were great people. Yeah. So I was never around that. So that gave me this whole outlook on the world. And then I went to live in Australia for two years doing the same part with a whole different cast, a younger cast. So they kept me on my P's and Q's, but they wanted a real black seaweed with the black accent. You know? <laughs> you can't, Australians oh. can't do the black, <laughs> the black sense. So for six years, I lived on my own for the first time in my life. And I'm telling you, it was just great. I needed that. I believe in just going with the flow, with the universe and the energies and everything. I don't mm -hmm. believe in forcing anything. Yeah, I really don't. I was always using my voice. That's yeah. what people think that I stopped singing. Well, I did stop making records but this right here's my baby yeah it was always being used well you've always had such a strong support system in your mom and 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 just others as well what was that shielding like for you when there were reports when there were comments this is before super digital social media age where we're reading everything that everyone in their basement has to say every second uh but Back then, it was still happening in a different way. Uh, questions about your sexuality, questions about you, people trying to figure things out. Did that get filtered through to you and how? No, no, I was protected. I was very much protected. And I didn't hide anything about me. I was me. I didn't give a damn, you know? Mm -hmm. I didn't try to act a certain way or anything. And I think the Warner Brothers was like, okay, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Because you just couldn't be that back then. Yeah. But what I really love about people is, you know, black people especially. <laughs> oh my God. Because we act like we don't have one gay person in our family, like a hey, gay cousin or a gay uncle, you know. I think that we have a lot of work to do when it comes to that. Accepting, there's a lot of stereotypes when it comes to LGBTQ plus uh, people. I didn't do the quote tweet, which was something to the effect of the girls tweeted something like, I had a talking to my mom and she told me that so-and-so and so-and-so and Tevin -so -and -so Campbell were gay. Mm -hmm. Help me. And I was like, well, Tevin is and put the rainbow, rainbow emoji. Flag. Yeah. But it was just a casual thing to me. I mean, yeah. you know, telling it to a whole bunch of people that I don't know. It, I don't care what people that I don't know or I will never meet or, you know, I love my fans, but what they think about me and my sexuality has no, is of no importance to me. Yeah. Like you support me. That's cool. It's so interesting to talk to you now about how that was like, yeah, Tevin is. And then it gets taken as this is it. Tevin Campbell has come, you know, oh, it's, <laughs> oh, it's like I have leprosy. That's the problem to me. Like, you know, when we can get to the place in society, especially black folks, where somebody can just say, you know, yeah, I'm gay. 
Like every person in the world isn't straight. When you get to a point in your life where you love yourself so much and you don't give a damn what people think or say about you, yeah. that feels so good. You gotta be you. You don't wanna yeah. die pretending to be somebody else. Absolutely. What the hell is that? In the music industry, when you see the Frank Oceans and the Lil Nas X's just sharing that part of themselves with fans, what goes through your mind? I hate that it wasn't like that in the 90s, but I'm glad that I get to see that. I wouldn't have been prepared when I was a kid to be a spokesperson of the LGBTQ plus community, but I'm glad that it's changing, you know, yeah. because there are a lot of kids, especially young black boys, that need to see representation. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, macho the machismo thing exists in our culture too, and it's poison. There are kids as young as five years old that have committed suicide, coming out to their friends and being bullied because they're not being taught to love themselves because of what they are. You know? Yeah, that's not good. Yeah, yeah. So we gotta gotta do better. I need to know what a day in the life is like for Tevin Campbell these days. How busy are you? Are you single? Are you in love? Are you too busy for either of those things? I'm in love with a lot of people. <laughs> I, <don't mostly. laughs> I think that is you're single and dating. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not dating. I'm working on another album. I know it's been a long time, but you know, I just want to do new music. I'm moving. I'm doing a lot of stuff. So this whole rest of the year, I'll be very busy uh, creating. Hopefully, by spring of next year, I'll release the album. So if anything happens. In the midst of that, that would be amazing. But I don't trust people very well when it comes to that. Yeah. So it's going to be very, I feel sorry for the person that comes after me. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> trying to be like, ooh, I'm poisoned, but I have trust issues. All child stars have trust issues. I would love to talk to um, Drew Barrymore one day. I love her because she's a child star. Yeah. She's been through it. You know what I'm saying? Like we all, and I've heard her talk about her trust issues and she starts just started dating. It's hard. It's really hard. I believe when you go looking for stuff like that. You never find it. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully it'll happen. Well, I, I have to ask the question. Is R&B dead? I think a lot of the passion is dead, but I think there's a lot of passionate artists out there that are doing great R&B music that are not being recognized. Mm. Like the mainstream artists. Jasmine Sullivan, to me, is... So she's a real R&B artist. <laughs> you know, her. They exist. Frank Ocean is great. He has swag. He has passion. And I can hear the lack of passion in a lot of R&B music too. Mm. So I think what's lacking is the passion. You know, when you try to sound like everybody else and try to get the crossover hit and, yeah. and do the hip hop R&B, which is nothing wrong with hip hop R&B, but if it's not your thing, don't do it just because you're trying to make it. I can hear it right away. You can't hide the fakeness in the mm -hmm. music. Somebody has to set the bar. And people like Jasmine, people like the ones I just mentioned, and mm -hmm. so I think they are setting the bar because there's a lot of trash out there. It's just it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's disgusting. But I don't think it's dead at all. Well, last but not least, what makes you happy right now? What makes you the happiest? I think what makes me the happiest right now is how far I've come in my life. Being able to look back on things and laugh at them and appreciate that and embrace that. The fact that I'm still here and be able to talk about it and laugh about it and smile about it. That's what makes me happiest right now. The fact that I've embraced me, because I used to beat myself up over little things. If you're 45 and you're still beating yourself up for your faults, it's, that's not a good thing. Love yourself. Love yourself. Love yourself. Love, you, love all of you, the bad and the good. Wow, Tevin, oh my gosh. Thank you so much for just being here, letting me sit eye to eye with you, okay? Yes, I threw Powerline back in there. Thank you for having me.